Aloha friends, it's Robert Stelic. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Planet Show, which I produce right here in my home office in the garage. On the show, I interview Wingfo athletes, instructors, designers, and thought leaders, and ask in-depth questions about Wingfo equipment and technique. I'm also trying to get to know my guests a little bit better, their background, how they got into water sports, what inspires them, and how they live their best life. I'm a visual learner myself, so I'm adding visual content that you can watch right here on YouTube, but you can also listen to these long form interviews on the go as a podcast. Just search for the Blue Planet Show on your favorite podcast app for the audio only podcast. These interviews are really long and unrushed. I just take my time and I really don't make them for the 50% of you that stop watching after 30 seconds. These videos are made for those 5% of you that watch all the way to the end. So I appreciate you guys. This show is just for you. If you are as foil brand as I am, kick back, relax, and just enjoy the show. Today's guest is Gunnar Binyash, who lives in Fuerteventura in the Canary Islands, which are part of Spain, even though they're off the coast of Africa. He's been creating YouTube videos for many years. He teaches wing foiling and runs the North Shore Surf Shop in Fuerteventura. We talk about his very international background, go over wing foil tips for beginners, switching your stance on the foil, and I also asked him to break down the upwind 360 spin or flaca for me since I've been struggling to pull it off. The tips he gave in this interview really helped me personally and I finally pulled off the move after talking to Gunnar. So I hope you get as much out of it as I did. We also talk in depth about foils, boards, wings, and living a good life. So without further ado, please welcome Gunnar Biniesh. Okay, Gunnar, welcome to the Blue Planet Show. It's great to have you. I really appreciate you coming on. How are you doing today? I'm great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm actually pretty happy. We've got quite a lot of wind in the last few weeks, so uh, a lot of time on the water, so I'm happy as can be. Great. Yeah, I've seen some of your videos. Great. Um, so let's start a little bit with with your background, like, you know, where, where did you grow up and how, how did you get into water sports and so on? And how did you get to live in the Canary Islands? Well, that's a long, long story. I mean, my background is uh, pretty complicated. Um, well, my, my father's German and my mom's Malaysian Chinese. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm born in, in Iran, which always causes a uh, slight issues with traveling um, around, especially to the US. Um, and then I actually grew up most of my life in Indonesia. Uh, wow, so wait, 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 there. wait. So you were born in Iran and yeah. like, wait, and your parents are, what, what are they, where are they from your parents again? My dad's German and my mom's Chinese Malay. That is so interesting. Okay. And then you grew up in, in Indonesia most of your childhood. Okay. Sorry, keep going. That that's uh, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we moved there when I was like six years old, and I pretty much left when I was 18 to go study in the UK. And then uh, well, during sorry, my study. Where, um, wait, let's go back again. So how did your parents meet and how did you get born in Iran? And how where in Indonesia did you grow up and so on? I want to know more about all that. <laughs> um well, my, my dad met my mom in Malaysia, I think in Kuala Lumpur. He was there um, for work. He was, a, he was an auditor. Um, so, yeah, they met there, um, had a bit of a long distance relationship for a little while, and then um, eventually got married. And yeah, 1978, um, my dad got a job where he was sent by his company to Tehran to. Um, to basically do the books there for the company. And that's where I was born. Um, I think it was like a couple of months before the revolution there. Um, so like after that, um, I, we, my parents like were in Germany for about a year and then we moved to Taiwan for a couple of years. And then, yeah, when I was six, we moved to, to Indo. And where did you live in Indonesia? In Jakarta. Oh, okay. Middle. that's a big city 
Yeah. Wow. So you have a very international um, background, very international upbringing. Okay. Yeah, so I, I'm German. I sound American and studied in the UK. It just like, confuses a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have much of a British accent. So, okay. So you, at, when you were 18, you went to the UK and, and yeah. went to university there or, or school yeah. or what? Yeah, to university, I went there to study computer science and then also accounting later on. And while I was there, um, I sort of got... I mean, I started kite flying kites when I was like 10 years old, when I was a kid, like my cousin got me into that. And then I took it a bit more seriously once I moved to the UK and got into power kiting, like kite buggy and kite buggy racing. And through that, I sort of stumbled upon kite surfing in like 99. And yeah, and then as soon as I started kite surfing, um, if you ask my parents, it all went wrong from there. Um, Cause that's when I, you know, I started basically taking it very seriously, started getting the first sponsors. And then I also then moved in 2000, I moved down to Fuerteventura um, to basically get more time on the water um, all year round. Um, yeah, I really haven't looked back since then. I mean, yeah, it's been a long, and, long career in kiting and now sort of into, into winging now. And how old are you now? I'm 43. Okay. And you're, you're married, you have kids or? Yeah. And yeah, I've been together with Doris for almost 16 years now. We have one daughter, she's eight. And, yeah. and you met her, Doris, in Fort Ventura and, or in the Canaries, or did you move there together? We met, met in Germany and then we had, a, I think, almost five years of a long, like long distance relationship. And then she eventually decided to move down. I think that was in 2009, I think, 2009, 2010. Okay. So, and then, and then how did you get into foiling? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that I first time I got encountered foiling was uh, 2005. Um, a friend of mine, um, got a hold of an aluminum foil, I think an old Rush Randall job. And I tried learning on that and that didn't work very well. Um, that was a horrible experience. It was really windy, really wavy, cold and so on, weather in Holland. And yeah, it didn't work quite well. Also snowboard boots and water is just, yeah, it was, wasn't the best. And so <laughs> we forgot about it for about five years. And um, actually in 2009 at one of the races, uh, actually, sorry, 2010 at one of the races, um, I met a guy called Mango. Um, and he had a bunch of held his foils with him. And they were sort of, let's call them fiberglass carbon jobs. Um, and yeah, I had to go on that. And then um, me and a friend ordered one here for Fort Aventura. And we got riding on that. And then pretty much got addicted very quickly. Right. And also, basically, both of us are very sort of engineering based and we love building stuff. So we eventually went, wait, we got to make this better. Um, also, because I want to travel with this. So we needed to have a foil where I could take the mass off the glider. So basically, get rid of that whole T bar system. Um, so we quickly started developing our own um, foil stuff. And that was in um, yeah, 2010. 2010. Yeah. I mean, in the early days of foiling, when I kind of got into it, you already had a lot of videos up on like a lot of like the, about the foils, breaking down the different foils and uh, like your tech talks and stuff like that. So that was super helpful for me to kind of understand how it works. And so, I mean, I guess you were, you were already foiling before like Kai Lenny posted his downwind foiling video and all that. Yeah. Or, I mean, you, yeah. For me, I mean, I was trying. For me, it was good that he did it and I, all the work that um, that Alex did and so on, Alex Aguera, because I was trying the same stuff just with the wrong equipment. Because when I basically also my history as basically as a racer, I've been uh, kite board racing since the beginning, like since 2005, doing the slalom, kite slalom, and then the whole racing tour. So for me, it was always going fast. So the foils that I was designing in the early days yeah and i was always saying basically all the foils that i was making were more for you know going faster and you know racing orientated so when i started 
basically surf foiling and wing foiling. I was doing this on super fast, super small foils, which, uh, yeah, it wasn't really great. I mean, they're a lot harder to ride. When we first started foiling, uh, Jeff and I, uh, Jeff, my friend Jeff Chang had a, a kite foil that was, yeah, like high speed, super thin, super small. Yeah. And we we're lo super long mast and we we're trying to learn behind the jet ski. And it was like, a, it was hard. I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to learn this. <laughs> so, so actually now when I look back at these videos, I'm amazed that I was actually able to learn half these maneuvers on the equipment that we had. Um, I mean, we we're on foils or they're, they're like a quarter of the size of what we ride now for kites. I mean, I think the foil in that that video is, uh, I think in square centimeters, it's something like 400 square centimeters. It's like nothing wow. compared to what you're right now. Yeah. So yeah, it was not, not, not the easiest. So when surf foiling came around and we were, I was trying to get it to work in the waves, I was convinced it has to work, you know, to paddle into a wave with a stand up paddle with, uh, with one of these foils. It, it just was, it sort of worked, but it was so fast and so unstable that, you know, it, it wasn't fun. And it was for me, it was great then seeing Kai on basically a big fat um, go foil back then, uh, the stuff from Alex. And I was like, oh, yeah, yep, yeah, that's the way. <laughs> go really big and go, um, go a lot slower, and that'll make uh, it all work um, on the waves for surfing and for stand up paddling. Yeah. And then what was the first kind of more? that kind of a foil, more surf oriented foil that you got and, and how did you get into that? Yeah, the first thing I did as soon as I saw that video was basically call Alex and order like two go foils. Um, <laughs> the, the original Kai um, yeah. wings. So. That's what I learned on too, the, the Kai wing. And now that's kind of considered a small wing for someone, you know, my size. <laughs> It's almost kite foils are those size now. Right. So yeah, that's the first one I had and then started on huge boards compared to what we use now. I mean, uh, back then I was on a hundred and like my very first board I started um, sort of foiling on was a, uh, I think 160 liter, like nine, nine, six stand up board. Let's see. Do you have some footage of that, that on should, your YouTube channel here? should be on the channel if you scroll up bit it's like somewhere in the middle of those if you go probably to video under videos because there's just so many videos on here you, here is subfoil siesta i think it's four okay yeah, i see the guy the foil one. let's have a look yeah. at this one okay so yeah so talk about the early days of foiling with the kai foil foiling with the kai foil was great i mean for me it opened up um like a lot like uh of options but when we were trying to surf foil with the kite foil it was um the only time it would work if you had almost overhead waves when we we're on such a small foil and obviously that was extremely scary so uh like here in this video you got nice and let's say small and controlled waves just a little bit of a bump that makes you know it's fun to surf foil when it's about twice the size of that and the foil is about four or five times the, the speed <laughs> um yeah it was scary Plus the foils were a lot sharper, the kite foils. Yeah. That looks very similar to how I started. I put I put a kite foil on an eight foot stand-up paddle board and kind of figured out how to make it go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd been foiling for I think well, seven years by that time. So for yeah. me, it was just about actually relearning stand-up paddling. Cause I I'd actually started stand-up paddling back in 2005 one of the the first guys on the island mm -hmm. and i just sort of got bored of it like in you know retrospect with the kiting because i had also a lot to do with the racing so i didn't really have a lot of time to go stand up paddling so much so i'd actually before i started properly like trying to make the whole um sub foiling thing work and i hadn't uh, stand up paddled in a while um not counting flat water paddling but actually in waves i just uh, it gets really full here, so it was just I, that's something I hadn't really progressed on as I should have. Um, so when the foiling came along, it allowed me to go in spots where no one else was. So I met, I was allowed to progress a lot faster with uh, with the subfoiling um, compared to with the normal stand up paddling. 
because hmm. the spot for example in that video um is actually just sort of the offshoot of uh of the main sort of wave spot um in town and then on a day like that if you basically go across to the actual main wave there's like 50 60 guys in the lineup waiting to catch a wave so it's not that fun right so surf oiling made that a lot easier and a lot more fun in general just to be out there crash on the rocks so yeah cool um yeah i mean that's and that's exactly how i kind of started and it was a pretty pretty long learning curve but um you know it was super fun and that's how i, I kind of got addicted to foiling it um but like with the advent of wing foiling i i tell people it's probably easier to learn foiling with a wing than foiling in waves what do you what do you think is that would you, would you oh, agree definitely. with that definitely i mean um on a teaching side uh, learning to foil immediately in in waves is probably the worst possible thing you can do um there's just so many variables everything's out of control you have to catch the wave you have to control your speed then you have to control the foil and then if you wipe out wrong you're very likely to get pounded by your board or hit by the foil so you know before winging obviously when we had people who couldn't kite or couldn't uh, windsurf we would teach them behind the boat you know towing them basically getting them to a halfway decent level of control with the foil before going anywhere near um, the waves with these guys. Um, and now with winging, it's a lot easier because now we've got a very controlled way of getting people on the water, basically sailing around. And especially compared to kiting where the general issue is when people are not doing well, they tend to end up just like in the old days of, you know, when you start to learn normal kiting, way off downwind, then you have to go out and rescue them. Whereas with winging, you can send people out. And if you taught them how to basically displace upwind, it's just like uh, good old beginner windsurfing with a dagger board. You can just basically, even if you're not flying, you can uh, keep upwind, you can learn slowly and sort of just slowly, slowly progress your way onto the foil and get flying and yeah, take it at your speed. Whereas most other foiling sports, you have to get up and flying um, immediately or else you end up somewhere else or it just doesn't work or it's no fun. Nice. Yeah, I was going to mention that too. Like when you, um, in the early days of wing foiling, you, I guess you worked together with Ozone to come out with yeah. these instructional videos. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like this one here got two, over 250,000 views. So a yeah. very popular instructional videos. And uh, I think they were very helpful for a lot of people to get into the sport. And also I, I've been sending people to your um, videos for learning how to do it on a regular stand-up paddle board or, you know. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that learning first for, you know, some tips for beginners. Like if somebody wants to get into wing foiling, you know, what's, yeah. what's the best way to learn it? Well, the most important part, um, and this is something a lot of people skip, is to really learn how to control the wing properly. A lot of people go onto the water a little bit too quickly. They just get a wing in their hand and just go. And um, they don't tend to learn how the handling works properly, so it makes life a lot harder. Um, if you can, try to get out on a skateboard on land. It will teach you a lot about the dynamics of how the wings work and handle placement, which handles to use to go upwind, especially um, for windsurfers. It's slightly counterintuitive, especially if you're here, like you're going on an SUP without a foil or any dagger boards in it. You have to be very careful what you're doing with the wing. Windsurfers tend to, for example, always just you know open up the wing, shove it back, and then hope it will all go upwind, which doesn't quite work. You have to combine it sort of with the kite mentality of, okay, I've got the board pointing up wind now. Now I actually have to move the wing forward again and sort of position it so that the wing can actually still also pull up wind once the board's done that. And actually skateboarding with the wing will teach you quite a lot of those skills before you get on the water. Um, and it's also quite useful for like standing up and so on if you just have that wing nicely under control and you're no longer dipping your wing tips into the water. Because for me, that was the most frustrating thing in the beginning um, on wing was knowing I could foil and knowing I could stand up paddle, but 
basically crashing every 20 meters because I dig the wingtips of the of the of the wing into the water and just catapulting straight over. Right. Um, and that's because basically when I started winging, I I did the mistake of just saying, right, I'm going to go straight on the water and I'm going to be able to do this. And yeah, it wasn't like that. It did it, it, it. It wasn't like a long, arduous thing. But for the first half an hour, I just spent a lot of time basically catapulting over the board. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the instinct is when the time. wing when the wingtip drags is for people to try to lift up their backhand to kind of get it out. And yeah. then what happens is it just tips forward and, and makes it worse, right? So it's like almost exactly. you have to like lift it up the front hand and push down with the backhand to get it to, to come exactly. back out Learning again. Learning essentially that, that counterintuitive thing is that if you want to make it go up, you actually have to push down on your backhand yeah. and things like that. And like I said, if you spend a bit more time on land, you'll learn that. And then you'll have a lot less um, of, a, of a hard time on the water. For sure. Um, and like I said, and, and a really important skill to have is essentially to when you're not flying is to actually still be able to go upwind um, on the board. Uh, so I have a lot of people actually still now, guys that have been doing it for a year are still, if the wind drops, even on a hundred plus liter board, these guys are ending up miles downwind mm. because they just haven't figured out how to actually just sit on, basically sit on the board or stand if it's a big board and just keep the wing open, hold it a slightly bit more forward and that you can still sail up wind in five or six knots. Um, yeah. Yeah. Without too much. Balance. No, I, and I agree. And in, in the last interview, Glenelg said um, she was mentioning kind of this, this kind of position here um, where you kind of hold the wing a little bit sideways and that turns yeah. the nose into the, the, into the wind. Right. And then, yeah. so if you can kind of keep that position where you have the wing a little bit to your side, that's, um, that's a, good pointer i think to to keep your nose kind of pointing a little bit into the wind exactly. instead of just letting it pull you downwind right exactly and the second part is to actually get rid of that downwind pull anyway so it basically hold it a bit farther forward so i mean in this video the wind is light but if the wind is stronger um i tell most of my guys to hold it more forward so I actually grab the surf handle and maybe the second handle on the strut to really mm -hmm. keep it open and it helps get much like nicer angle. You're not going to be going fast, but you're going to keep a nice upwind angle. So try to basically displace with the least amount of power and not just shut the wing and try to get power to make it go upwind. Because that doesn't okay. work. So let's talk a little bit about, about more about um, tips for beginners. Because I, I know a lot of people that are watching are just getting into it too and and, and just need help getting um, get, figuring it all out. So uh what let's start with the equipment like what what do you recommend if i don't know do you teach other people how to wing foil at all and like what yeah. what would you what kind of gear would you put them on to get started um like i said the first when i when i do my courses the first hour is typically um somewhere in a car park or we have a nice hard area behind the beach just about half an hour just controlling the wing like a three or four meter wing learning the basics of control and handling, you know, especially and that's just standing on the beach or something, no skateboard exactly. or anything, right? Yeah, exactly. And then after that, get them on a skateboard. We've got these like really large longboard skateboards, like, you know, dancers. So basically a meter long and with really fat um, skate wheels, like all terrain wheels. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then we send them off because of these large wheels, they don't get super fast, but they get moving, which gives them a bit of apparent wind and it gives them a good, idea of what, how what's happening mm -hmm. um and there i progress on to teaching them essentially okay if you hold the wing slightly farther forward on the handles is what happens is what happens when you hold it farther back you also tend to teach um, basically what happens if you move the wing forward actively what happens when you shift it back you know hold it higher and so on which handles do what um and yeah, so usually at the end of like an hour and a half, most people on the skateboards are actually doing their first jibes. Some are doing their first tacks and around they're, they're getting a real good handling for the wing, basically being able to turn around. And that's when we go onto the water. Um, and if, if I have guys who've had some foiling experience beforehand, we will typically then go straight on to a board with a foil, something like around 100, 110 liters, depending on uh, the person's weight. 
and the large foil because pretty much sure that once they take off, they will be more or less be able to handle the foil flying uh, if they've got more than a year's worth of um, foiling experience. If they don't have any foiling experience, um, I'll put them nowadays on an inflatable board with two side fins and um, send them out on that in flat water and basically get used, getting them used to standing on a board. A lot of the guys who haven't followed yet also have typically no water sports experience or not a lot of it. So getting them some balance on like a stand up paddle is, uh, is essential. <laughs> So, um, getting, sorry, what do you mean by two fins? Is it like, are they like center fins, kind of like um, dagger board fins or more like just regular fins in the back of the board? Um, they are about halfway up the board, uh, closer to the rails. And they are like a, a eight inch, um, like sort of FCS. So, so um, that helps cool. with, so you don't drift off, right? I mean, that's one of the issues, yeah. like if people use a regular stand up paddle board to learn is that there's a lot of drifting going on, right? And it's hard to stay upwind with a board that only has fins on the tail, right? Exactly. And with this type of board, it's super easy to stay upwind. You can get actually quite decent speed on those things. And also because they're quite large, it, you know, it's very good entry for most people into a water sport in general. So they're learning what the wind is doing on the water and how the board's reacting. They develop a good sense of balance. And then typically, once they're okay with that board, that's when we move them on to the foil. And they're again, very large foils in the beginning, sort of around the four liter volume for the front wing. Um, and then, yeah, get them to go on that board. Same thing, teach them with that foil board, how to go upwind, how to build speed. And then once they have that speed, teach them essentially how to put the board back down again once it lifts off. So basically just you know, keeping your weight forward, using your knees to uh, position your body farther forward uh, by bending your front knee and then put the board back down and well, basic foil teaching, uh, open the wing and stop flying. You know? mm. and, and typically, I mean, the worst, the worst students I've had, they've still learned to foil within two weeks. Um, after doing a course because at the end of the course because they can they can go upwind even without foiling they're they're basically independent so they're confident enough just to go out with their equipment and learn to fly by themselves because they know they can always just uh you know sail back without the foil yeah i mean and that's something i i tell people too like you know, they spend like thousands of dollars on buying all the equipment, but then they're too cheap to take a lesson, you know, so just by taking some getting some professional instruction, it'll just make everything so much easier and, and quicker to learn. I mean, exactly. I, mean I, I learned it pretty much by um, trial and error, but it took me way longer than it would have if I hadn't gotten a few good tips along the way, right? Yeah, exactly. But each to their own and the the cool yeah. thing, or let's say for, for schools, that's a bad thing about winging is that it's a fairly safe sport to teach yourself compared to kiting or windsurfing. Um, you know, the wing is relatively soft. You're not going to like, uh, you know, smack your head in um, with, like with windsurfing with the mast or the, or the boom. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, you're not going to fly away like you can with the kite. So um, it sort of lends itself for people to, you know, just take their time and go out by themselves. Obviously, you learn a lot faster, like in any sport, if you have somebody who knows what they're doing and can basically see your errors and correct you and get rid of the first bad habits right in the beginning. Um, but I find it's not as necessary um, with this sport yet. I mean, most of the people learning it are relatively coordinated, but... I've also had people start from zero and they've learned it fairly quickly. You know, people yeah. have never done any water sports before and they still learned it quite quickly because it just gives you confidence because you're not scared of the equipment as much as you are with a lot of the other sports. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's definitely, um, I, I think wing foiling is probably the easiest way to get into foiling. Um, as I, I think anyways, do you agree with that? Like that's probably like if yeah. somebody wants to learn how to foil, it just gives yeah. you so much time, you know, maybe other than towing behind the boat with a professional instructor that might be, yeah. um, or an electric foil maybe, 
but to really kind of get a lot of time on the foil wing foiling is just such a good way to do it exactly yeah um yeah i mean for i would say it's like the as i said if you're going to teach yourself and you're you're going to give yourself as much time as possible it's definitely the the easiest way to learn how to foil um uh, i mean obviously a boat and the teacher is going to be the fastest way always yeah because it's a very controlled environment but that obviously involves having the coach there and you know having the boat for that and then winging is the next best thing because once you learn how to control the wing and like i said stay upwind you can teach yourself um the foiling it's not that important compared to you know the wing skills cool well let's fast forward a little bit to um now you're riding obviously a much smaller board and yeah. you're kind of on different equipment and I'm pretty impressed that you still, um, it looks like you, you pretty much always switch your stance going either, yeah. either way, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's sort of ingrained in me from, from kite foiling and from kite foil racing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming everybody's going to end up that way anyway. Um, <laughs> I always find it a bit of an excuse from people where they tell me, it's like, no, nah, I, I need that center strap, that asymmetrical center strap. I don't need the jive. It's like, eh, give yourself a year. <laughs> you'll you'll, yeah. you'll figure it out a jive and then you'll either go strapless or you'll you'll get like a V strap like and you know go to the more windsurfing side where you just have the advantage of having um basically riding your your switch and your strong side. Well, I don't know. That's, that's something I'm struggling with is uh, switching stands. I, I can do it on a bigger board with a big foil, but when I get on my small board like small board with straps and the smaller foil and the waves and stuff. I, I don't even attempt to, <laughs> I don't even think about switching my stance. I just always stay in the same position. So maybe can you, you give should. some pointers, pointers on how to switch your stance, you know, how the learning process. Um, well, I can basically rewind a little bit because when I was, um, basically wave riding, like surfing or kiting or stand up, I think I would never, uh, basically go on my on my switch side yeah that was you probably have a video about this which video should we no watch? actually i don't Talk. this has been something you i've don't. been meaning to do for ages but never have gone around but essentially <laughs> uh, you get into this mentality in a, in a sports like ah, i can i can only ride regular and i'm gonna ride all the waves if i wind from the left i'm gonna ride back side and i'm gonna only gonna ride front side with with the wind from the right but actually when foiling came around it wasn't comfortable in a lot of um, sort of wave spots when I was sort of kite wave foiling. And then I sort of forced myself to, to ride the waves on my switch side. I mean, coming from the racing background, I was able to ride the foil, you know, switch or regular because I mean, you have to. You're not going to win a race if you're going toe side up the course. Right. Um, so for me, it was just basically just crunching down and saying, look, this next two, three sessions, you're only going to ride on your weak side. You're going to ride the waves, basically left foot back. And you're just going to do it. You're going to crash a lot, but you're just going to force yourself to do it because it, it can't be that hard. And because foiling doesn't involve a lot of strength and having to push really hard on the back foot, um, it's actually pretty easy to learn decent control on your switch side. So right. um, for me, it was I was already doing that with the kite foils and the waves, and uh, so when I started winging, it was normal. It's easier for me to actually ride front side, you, you know, no matter where the wind's coming from. Right. Okay. It's actually not a, like I said. It's not a hard skill to learn. It's just something you have to you have to force yourself to do because you know you know everybody's got a, a like a strong and weak side, but you can sort of overcome that fairly easily on the foils. I think this one shows you switching stance quite a bit. So maybe yeah. we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. But so if we're talking, if you're talking about just basically switching your feet, you'll see it now. It's most important part is that pump. This okay. is what um, I keep meaning to make a video on this. I just keep yeah. not having time for it. But I when I never see any of the, and when I almost never see any of the new guys talk about is that 
that initial pump before you go into any maneuver, you, either a jibe or a tack or you know, almost anything where you want to switch your feet. And okay, so, so walk quickly. us through it. So here at this point, you kind of do a little pump with the here, here, foil I, I or with the wing? The board, oh, here. Bam, I pump it. You see a nose yeah. popping up. That's my sort of pump. And what that sort of does, it sort of A, accelerates the board, which gives more stability. But as I move my body weight forward to switch my foot, um, that board is also trying to rise with me. Yep, so it can take my body weight as I move my back foot forward. So I pump, I step forward, basically yep, moving your whole weight, body weight forward into those straps and those four positions. And you quickly switch your feet. Nice. Yeah. And the most important part of that is essentially is that pump. And when I'm coaching people, mainly for kite foiling and so on, now a little bit more for wing for their jibes, is I tell them to do three pumps and on the third one, switch your foot. Hmm. So you get into it. So basically count one pump, two pump. And on the third one, that's when you basically step forward to switch your feet. But basically, before you attempt to do it on up on foil, obviously you want to practice it with a touchdown jibe, like you kind of showed earlier with the on the kite foil, right? Yeah. Like touchdown on sense. the water, then switch your feet, and then come back up again. I guess, but I I would tend to tell people just to go for it in the beginning, because if you get it wrong, you will touch down, and then just don't panic when you touch down. I mean, most boards are good enough now that uh, when you touch down, they don't like stop so much. They'll keep going. Um, so if you go for like your normal air jibe and if you do it correctly, if you move your weight forward, what a lot of people do in the beginning, which is slightly wrong, is that they, they try to pull their front foot back as they're switching their feet. They sort of try this jump um, jump switch, which is actually really hard. And actually, most decent foilers don't do that. What most people do is actually you're basically, yeah, you see, I brought my back foot forward. I brought my entire body weight over the front straps and I'm standing straight. Mm -hmm. So the worst thing that can happen there is essentially if you take too long, you will touch down. Yeah, the board won't fly away. Nothing will happen. You'll just touch down and then you can just switch your feet on the water um, after that. So okay. I would just say, go, go for it. Um, and as long as you keep your body weight forward, um, nothing much can go wrong. Yeah, because obviously if you put your weight too far back, then the foil comes out of the, you know, the foil will just shoot up because you have to be if able you put to... put any weight back, that's yeah. typically why most people fail um, on a foiling jive mm -hmm. or an attack. They, they, sh they shift their weight back because they've moved their foot back and then that board shoots away. It unbalances the board. Um, but if you basically step forward over in front of the board, the foil is trying to lift anyway. So if you're over it, um, yeah, I said the worst that can happen is happen is you touch down. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. fairly safe way of doing it. So okay, you messed up, you've touched down, switch your foot, and then keep going. Yeah. Okay. Um, whereas typically, if you screw it up the other way, if you step backwards and you screw it up, the foil flies up into your lines or flies in front of you, and when you're winging. So, yeah. So, I mean, switching your foot is not actually not that hard a skill as long as you, there's a few key things that you really need to, need to do and it gets easy. Right. And the biggest thing, which uh, people, when I explain it to them, they're like, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? Is that you step forward. It's always stepping forward and not stepping back. Hmm. Once you stop yourself from trying to like slide your foot back and then slide your front foot forward at the same time, you just step forward and have both your feet on the front of the board. It actually gets pretty easy. Okay. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to practice it some more. And it helps if you do it with a big board or a longer board, because it's sort of, if you touch down, you're more, you're less likely to, you know, get stuck. Yeah, for sure. And you don't have to be as accurate with your foot placement and so on too, you know, when you're on a bigger board That's and, true. and a bigger foil to a bigger stable foil helps a lot. Yeah, like I, yeah, because I can do it on a bigger board and a bigger foil, but not on my small board and my small foil. So, yeah, I mean, on small on small foils, essentially, this is where um, well balls come in because you have to do it fast. 
<laughs> if you go in, if you actually go into your jibe at full speed on a small foil, it'll just it'll be just as stable as your big foil. Plus, it'll be easier because you can actually um, correct the small foil better. And it and it has less drag, so you get you keep up your speed easier too, right? And a smaller exactly. Yeah. So the initial thing is that you just you don't pussy out and you just go straight into that jive at good speed, and then it's fine. Okay. Now, and another good tip um, is to jive into the wave mm. because that will give you speed. Yeah. So especially what I do if I'm if I'm out in like six seven knots um yeah the biggest screw up you can possibly do in those winds is to touch down so what i'll typically look for is a nice like bump or a wave and i'll jibe on that and use that speed i can get from that wave to complete the jibe yeah, if i know i'm on a smaller foil it's just really not enough wind to to get going again that that's a good so tip because a lot of times wave, if you jibe in between the waves then there's like you, you lose yeah. all your power you kind of get backwinded and and then you drop off the foil right yeah so you need yeah, a little so bit basically just go straight into that face and it'll actually be a lot easier than if you did it in the flats mm -hmm. cool so let's talk a little bit about how you and you know ended up in Fuerteventura I guess you were studying like computers uh, computer science or yeah. and uh, engineering type of stuff so yeah. what you know I mean what made you decide to kind of give up a career in that and uh and be a beach bum in in Fuerteventura <laughs> uh, I learned to kite surf that was the biggest problem um <laughs> yeah, as soon as I learned to kite surf I was like it combined everything I, I like. I mean, like speed and water and being able to jump on land without killing myself. I mean, if you look at power kiting back then in the pre 2000s, it was extremely dangerous. We were out, you know, six, seven meter foil kites jumping on land. And a lot of my friends got seriously injured <laughs> um, and so on. So for us, like water was like, oh, great. You know, we can jump and if we screw up it, doesn't kill us and it doesn't hurt. Um, so I got really addicted to kite surfing really fast. And then um, what started as essentially my winter job here in Fortaventura working for the Flag Beach Center. Um, eventually, the year later, I was like, I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> it's nice and warm. We've got good waves and it's basically still Europe. Yeah, and I can uh, kite here every day. So, so that's and, what I did. and so how do you I mean so yeah obviously you're kind of just living the dream you just decided okay screw screw that and I'm gonna yeah. live in in a beautiful place I'm kind yeah. of very similar to you in that regards I guess but yeah so how did you make it work how did you make you know how do you make a living how can you make it all work I mean in the beginning like I said I was working for the Flag Beach Center I was like the main kite instructor there for a good number of years and um around it was I started competing in 2000, like seriously in 2003, I already done some competitions in the UK, like 2002. And then 2003, I started competing in the first PKRA events. Um, and then at, I think the German championships, I actually met some guys from Peter Lynn kiteboarding back then. And they were the first guys to offer me a proper deal as a rider. And so pretty much a year later, I quit my job at Flag Beach as an instructor and basically turned sort of full-time pro back then. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily with them, the designers, probably one of my best friends still, um, he basically took me under his wing also. And, you know, I was giving him the feedback on his, on his kites, but he was also teaching me how to tune these kites, how they're made. He pretty much taught me everything sort of about sort of the, the back end of the industry, you know, supply chains, how kites are actually made, how surf plan works, sort of everything sort of that prepared me for sort of what I do now. Um, so, yeah, so I was with Peter Lin until 2009, um, basically writing for them and also helping them in the development for quite some time. And then... In 2010, I decided to join Fly Surfer. Um, initially, that started off the fact that I just 
I was sick of losing races to those guys with 19 meter kites. I was just basically wanted the same thing. Plus, um, the boss Armin is basically from the same hometown town as I am in Germany. He's from Frankfurt. So we got along quite well. And then, uh, yeah, I was racing for them and I was team manager for them until 2013. Um, and then, um, yeah, I decided to, let's say, follow the money. And I went uh, and did a year with Gastron, which was not the most successful year. It's also the time where everyone sort of finally believed, oh, great, foil kites will, will win races. And I actually went to a tube kite brand, which was probably not the greatest idea. Um, but after that, um, I pretty much went to Ozone after that. And I, pretty good five, six years with those guys. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting company to work with. Um, but um, by the time I joined Ozone, I'd already opened my own um, uh, kite shop basically here on the island. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also mm -hmm. we, I had my own sort of foil brand, sort of the magma foils, which we sort of um, tried to get working back then, which is a bit difficult from the islands here. Mm -hmm. And we had a bit of a bad luck in the production. Um, but also like in 2016, I started uh, doing a bit of freelance design for foils for, um, for brands. Um, so yeah. And sort of now I, the way I earn my living is I have my shop. I actually took over, um, uh, last year, um, I took over the North shore surf shop here, um, on the Island. He used to belong to probably the most famous German windsurfer around Jürgen Hernscheid, his old shop. Oh yeah. So yeah, I've sort of been doing that. But besides that, I've been basically freelance designing boards. Um, most of them you've probably seen from Indiana. And I've been doing a lot of basically testing work for a lot of brands for their wings and their foils. So some I can talk about, some I can't. Mm -hmm. um, or NDAs, but um, and then also last year um, I decided to work with the guys from North basically as a team writer and R and D writer also. Cool. Ah, so pretty, uh, pretty interesting background there. So how many languages do you speak? Uh, three and a half. Okay. Like so English, my, German, Spanish, Spanish. Okay. And yes, yeah. so my, my, my Indonesian sort of hangs on, but it's just don't, don't practice it enough. So if you go there, you could probably speak it, huh? Probably, probably it's an so easy do language. You, do you have any cool stuff? I see so many uh, interesting toys behind you in your man cave. Yeah. But um, you know, anything you can show us? Not lots. I mean, these are just some of the foils. All right. I mean, I I typically tend to switch foils every day. But the one cool thing I have here is um, a mask from a guy called Kyle in the U.S., which basically, when I'm testing, allows me to uh, not not have a different mass for every foil company I ride. Mm. So basically it's a custom carbon mass and you can basically put different adapters on here. For example, this is the Moses adapter. Mm -hmm. And then if I want to ride a North foil with it, um, I just put a North adapter on it. And if I want to ride an Indiana foil, I put an Indiana adapter. If I want to ride an Axis foil, I put an Axis adapter. So when I'm testing them and trying to figure stuff out, I basically remove the, the mass as a variable. Ah, interesting. So all foils, you know, ride a bit differently depending on their mass because you've got so many different mass designs. Right. And I also like it because it's a lot lighter than almost all the other carbon masks I have. Huh, interesting. So quite like hey, it. Maybe fun. send me that link and I'll put it in the description down below if anyone's interested yeah, sure. in getting yeah. a custom mask made. <laughs> he finally sent me a proper, like, we've got, he's got a new sort of um, stronger mask now for winging. Uh -huh. um because you know i've been doing too much freestyle and freestyle is never good for for foils or for the boards yeah <laughs> when you land badly so nicely like stronger reinforced plate and so on yeah. and so for um for the north um kites i'm not really familiar i mean north um foils yeah. uh, what do you use for winging like what's your most your favorite foil that you're using right now for for wing foiling okay um, it depends if I'm either in the waves or if I'm freestyling. I have like two favorites. Okay. And this is the one where this is the one where people are gonna freak out at me. Basically, my favorite big wave 
foil is this? Low aspect. Low aspect, super old school. But the cool thing about the north one is the fuselage is only 60 centimeters. So it's mm. short. Right. Um, and this wing's not slow. So it's actually, this is a 1500. Mm. But this works in everything. <laughs> I've had this in super horrible, turbulent, really currenty, big waves. And I've survived a lot better than I have with the high aspect wings mm -hmm. on this. And I actually have a lot of fun. I, like I said, I ride this most of the time if the waves are actually really good because it just really, really works. And I know it's completely contrary to where everyone else is going at the moment. And it's designed as a beginner wing, but for waves, yep. No, I mean, um, I think there's definitely- that How well it worked. There's definitely a lot of merit to having uh, lower aspects foils yeah. for, um, I guess, just control and and uh, like you said, like going through white water, certain things that they just don't drop off yeah. as easily too. They're easier to exactly. It's just a lot less scary when you've got yeah. basically an overhead wave breaking behind you and just yeah. you, know, you hit a bit of turbulence. Like I don't care. Whereas with a high aspect wing, you're like, oh, oh, I'm wobbling, yeah. and then you get the. So what about freestyling? So for freestyling, my main wing I'm using at the moment, it's actually two different ones. For like lighter winds, I use the, the North DHA250. It's basically, I mean, it's called a high aspect wing. I mean, but. Um, How much curve? Can you show it from aspect. the front? Can you show the curve of the foil? Yeah, it's your oh, yeah. typical sort of um, downward yeah. okay. wing. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, it has a little bit of upturn on the tips, huh? Yeah. A bit of twist, yeah. Uh, it works really good. I tend to ride this on the long fuselage, actually. It's, this is the, the 700, the, the 70 centimeter fuselage. Okay. Um, um, I quite like it for freestyle because it just got, it's got a bit more acceleration and pop mm -hmm. out of the way and sort of pumps out of like the jumps a bit better. So if you, you know, land it slightly wrong, you can still get up and pump it out with the performance it has quite a bit yeah. and it works really nice in sort of normal wave conditions if you've got nice and clean conditions um but like right. I, said, I tend to and i don't know if you said already but how many square centimeters is the surface it's, area uh, um normal surface area it's uh 1250 and it's projected 1230 okay cool yeah. so let me um, just actually pull up the screen sharing again is that the one you're using in uh in the, the most recent wave video yeah well, part of it sometimes. Well, in that video, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's the one I'm using, yeah. So yeah, I actually wanted to ask you, like this is the move I've been trying to pull off and kind of struggling with the landing. I, I keep, um, I don't know what, like the wing, I, I can't get the wing right on the landing. So can you kind of maybe walk us through this this move step-by-step? Step? The Flaka, yeah, oh. or the Upwind 360, right. Um, Again, the, the most important crux of this move initially is that you keep the wing low off to one side and really open. A lot of people try to bring up the wing over their head way too early. And I that's what involves you then turning it into a push loop and then crashing. Um, and the other part is just after takeoff, what you really need to do is like when you sort of you kick up, you need to twist. The board first you're trying to sort of 180 the board first and then you look over your shoulder and the board will follow if you try to rotate your body without twisting the board first it sort of uh, doesn't allow you to rotate around far enough yeah so this, is, this, is, this this right here like right before you jump you go yeah. down with the nose and i think that's what a lot of people miss when they're trying to jump is like doing a little yeah downward push and then and then you really want to kind of pop that foil up at a steep angle upwards right to get yeah. some air i mean that's foil jumping 101 that's right just regardless if it's wind foiling wing foiling or kite foiling um, any foil jump you're going to use the foil as a ramp so you need to if you want a nice big jump you have to use a big ramp which means get that nose low to the water and then point it up that's what's going to get you launched Mm -hmm. If you sort of, if you don't do that, you sort of just get into a flat little jump. It's like if you've taken off of a small piece of chop as compared to hitting like a two meter ramp. Um, 
So that's just your normal jump. You should do that any any foil jump you do is try to get as low as possible and then try to point up as aggressively as you can. Um, I mean, the second part of the flaka essentially is is that twist is um, knock everything over. It's like when you're up in the air, you need to basically basically flip the board over. You want to point that nose down so that you've done half the rotation already, so that when you let your, the rest of your body follow that um, that rotation, that it's sort of the board is already around. So if you if you don't go around far enough, you tend to land um, off center. So here the nose is up, and then see I've twisted the nose around before the rest of my body's come around. I've already gone 180 degrees with the board, and then as the board touches down, I've already gone you know, three quarters at least of the way around with the board. And the next sort of important part is that, again, as you're in the air, as you're rotating, you need to keep that wing stable off to the side. You don't try to lift it up. When you see people learning, the first mistake they do is they try to, they jump and then they lift up the wing over their head as they're trying to spin. Mm -hmm. And that actually does two things. It stops your rotation. And also the wing will then try to um, lead that rotation, which is a new trick in itself. If you're high enough, it'll turn into a push loop. It's sort of, the, the, it's sort of like a kite loop with the wing. Mm -hmm. So, but that's not something you want to do when you're learning this because it's scary when you do that. Yeah, so and you don't, like I've lead. learned too, that you don't want to jump too high to do, to do it. Like, yeah. <laughs> actually, height will help you, but... It's yeah. important that you, if you keep that wing off to the side, so if you keep the wing more or less high, head level, yeah, as yeah. you go around, you'll land, and then you can just basically rotate the wing over, over your head once you've landed. If you try to rotate the wing over your head when you're in the air, that's when it will slam you because the wing will go behind you and then dive straight down. Mm. Um, and that's the most scary part. I mean, it... I broke three different carbon masks before I learned that. Because I'd just be landing like super hard because I'd basically lead with the wing and then turn it into a push loop and then slam the foil sideways like onto the water. Um, I mean, it looks easy here, but there's a few things, like I said, the most important part, if you keep your, the wing low, right there I did it slightly wrong. You saw that wing just hit that water quite hard. Yeah. The only well, ones I've pulled off were actually where I hit the water. It seemed, it seemed to help me when I, when I was able to pull them off. Yeah, it gives you a bit of balance, but it's just, it, it means that you've raised up your hands okay. too high before you rotate it. And it, in the end, it's not good for your foil or for your wing when you constantly whack it. <laughs> right. Into the yeah, water yeah, so Because uh, here you hit it almost like flat onto the water. Yeah. yeah. Here I just, I had it. I, I rotated too early. I, I tried to bring the wing around too early. See, there it's over my head instead of lower to the side. And that's what basically causes it to sort of go into that loop. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, and yeah, so you, the way to prevent it from sort of going to loops, you keep it off to the side and you really, you keep your back hand low. You try to push actually that back handle down as you're trying to bring that around. That again is, remember, like when you push down on that back handle, it causes the wing to go up. Yeah. Okay. The reason it typically tends to drop down is because you've also then lifted your hand up as you've tried to bring it around. You probably see it there that I actually, as it went around, my, my, my back hand rose up on that crash, basically. See, watch my back hand. And now it's going to go up. You see how it's gone uh, up and over? So you catch the wind way. basically the wrong way. Exactly. So what? remember like when you're just controlling the wing on the beach, if you want the, you know, the tip to come up, you push down. And if you raise your backhand, the wing goes down. It's the same thing that applies here. So if you forget to keep your hand low and basically push that backhand away from you in that trick, um, if you see my backhand should extend out that's hard to see behind mm -hmm. now you can see there i'm pushing it down hard and it just comes around all right 
Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for the tips. Yeah. So good. Good move. I see a lot of guys. Well, I don't know. I, like I was watching Balls Miller was probably the first to do those kind of tricks. And yeah, um, I like watching his videos too. Yeah, I mean, I, I spent too much time on this one because I actually unlearned some of the other cooler stuff. Because <laughs> it's, like it's actually, this is a fairly safe one because you don't tend to hit the board when you screw it up. Uh -huh. Whereas actually the first rotation I learned, which I just don't have any videos of, and I'm actually at the moment gotten scared of doing it is basically the backside rotation to that so basically you jump up and you rotate the other way yeah 60 and that's the hamstring killer right? it's like if you screw it up you you hit the rail of the board oh all the time and yeah as i've been doing too many of these flakas and like now i've gotten scared of doing the other one so my my goal for the next month is essentially just relearn all the the backside tricks now because mm -hmm. uh, they're actually harder <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, and then in terms of the board you're using, do you do you have that in your man cave as well? No, there's not enough room. <laughs> um, the, also, the problem is I've, I've had a bit of a nightmare the last week. I've been I've like trashed three boards, so they're all in repair. Um, oh. Yeah, rocks. Uh, the downside of when you ride without a leash is that sometimes you forget the R conditions where you you should have a leash on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so ended up with boards in the reef um but essentially i i ride a lot of different boards i mean it's part of the job anyway just to test as much as possible and also just trying to figure out what works and doesn't but i mean i, I try to ride as small as possible um as soon as the wind goes down especially for for wave riding so i mean a lot of the videos will see me like on the 33 liter it's a 44 yeah Mm -hmm. um but then for freestyle if i'm trying to take it more seriously i'll use actually a larger board like a 60 liter 65 liter board because it's just a lot easier if you land and don't sink down to your waist immediately I mean, sorry what, I, what's your body weight can you share i weigh 87 kilos so 87 kilos like and then for light wind 60 liters is what you like yeah. to use okay yeah so if you could order a new board exactly the way you wanted it, what, what dimensions and volume would you get? So if we're talking freestyle, yeah, like 60, 65 liters, um, something like four, eight, four, seven. I mean, I've got the luxury of uh, got guys like Indiana, which will pretty much let me do whatever I want with my board. So I basically, here's the design, make it. And they're like, okay. And they'll do it and we'll release it next year. Um, so I have that luxury. So that's the freestyle board you probably that's in that one video where I'm on that 65. That's the prototype for next year. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my freestyle thing. No gimmicks, no, no concaves, no kicktails, just purely designed for performance. Get off the water. And mm -hmm. then uh, for wave riding, yeah, I mean, I'll use anything that's small. I mean. At the moment, I'm just basically trying to um, get the north boards to work and figure out how we're going to improve those. Um, they're sort of working. They're very similar to the KT type style boards. You've got the cutouts in the back and the kicktails and concaves, which personally not a big fan of concaves on boards. I tend to like a board to not break when it hits the water. I want it to glance off, which I know is not the most comfortable for the knees, but I just I like the fact that boards don't try to stick to the water when they touch yeah. down after jumps. Interesting. Yeah, I was talking to Kane the Wild about that too. Um, he, and he says, yeah, he likes the boards that have kind of more of a soft, softer bottom, a little bit convex, or just like. But yeah, when you touch down on the water, they just handle more. They're more neutral than having like hard rails and and sharp edges and concaves and things like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, our sharp edges, I think, are quite useful for winging because they prevent the, the side slip of the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends where you put that hard rail. Right. But like on my boards, I tend to like to have that transition from the from the bottom onto the bevel quite sharp. Because essentially, if you're out in like six, seven knots, that sharpness allows you to sort of stop that sideways drift a bit and still allow you to displace back. Whereas if you're a very round... Um, shape which actually lends itself better for freestyle um because actually the easiest board you can possibly learn like the 360s on is an inflatable 
because hmm. they've got the fat round nose with basically no sharpness in that rail whatsoever and those you can get almost completely wrong landings on and you can still slide it around really easily it, it hmm. really recovers forgiving um but the bad side of that is in those conditions where you need that board to displace upwind it's not going to do that with without some sharpness on the rail right yeah. so when when you're taking off it like uh, in light wind do you think you like that's something I've, I've been wondering do you use the the speed of the board to kind of get planing and then lift yep. off or do you kind of lift off with the foil before you even get up to planing speed no um the biggest revelation to me was actually it was a la beginning of last year is taking one of my old kaifo race boards and those big um, 90 liter tankers mm -hmm. like 70 centimeters wide i took that and i took a windsurfing foil on the bottom of that and then that got going so much better than anything else i had um and down to the fact that those boards are designed for acceleration because the problem with if you take like an sup board sure they pump up easily on the kick tail they allow the board to rise up but as you have no apparent wind the wings we have are just not a, as efficient as a kite or windsurfing sail. So you'll pump yourself up and essentially immediately backwind your wing because uh, it's just not enough apparent wind on the wing to work. Whereas if you get a board that can actually pick up speed with very little resistance, by the time you get up on, onto the foil, there's enough apparent wind for your wing to actually start engaging and pulling. Hmm. So in like six, seven knots, having a board that when you pumped it once would basically lurch forward on the water like a meter and a half you know you did that three times you'd cover like almost a 10 meter distance and then you'd have almost five knots of apparent wind mm. and all of a sudden oh the wing is up and you're going and you're going with no wind whatsoever right so that's why on, on my my own, my own boards that i prefer you won't see any concaves or any kicktails or any cutouts or anything um because I like the, having that maximum acceleration in the beginning to get the foil and the wing to work together quickly. Do you have a video of that on your channel? Session log number four, uh, wind foiling on old race boards. Okay. Okay, so tell us about this board that you're, that you're saying um, planes and really light winds, right? Yeah, I mean... Like the, the one I'm on here in this video is an, as a Tema Vento. This was probably the, the best, most expensive uh, race board you could buy back in 2012. Is this is this for kite racing or, or windsurfing? For, for kite racing before okay. foiling started. Okay. Yeah. And I basically have, I think it's the Moses wind foil set up at the bottom of this. Okay. Um, I mean, here it's fairly windy. The first time I tried it. But I mean, these boards are designed, they actually have a V, more of a V shape in the back. So slightly convex in that sense and really plain. And yeah, they have virtually no resistance in the water. So when you pump, they just basically start planing. They just lurch forward, mm -hmm. which if you put a foil on the bottom of it is, is great because they'll, they'll get the foil up to its essential flying speed very quickly with very little resistance. Okay, so that's a good tip. So basically, if you want to get going in really light wind, get a board that that just planes easily and kind of, um, I mean, obviously, a little bit longer. Good. Good. Yeah, I mean, this board's not that long. It's a six foot board for oh, okay. ninety meters, but uh, interesting. As I remember, this is two thousand and nineteen. Um, this was actually pretty small for most people right back then and i think the standard back then was like people on 120 liter boards when they when they were starting right so um i mean but the concept scales down quite nicely like you know on my my 60 liter board is basically based on the exact same concept um your maximum volume um distribution is right under your front foot slalom slalom type um, rocker line scoop rocker line um yeah and like i said the most important part is is to not have any anything that drags on the bottom of the hull um 
It's like probably the worst culprit for really light wind winging is probably the, the cutout. Hmm. You know, and cutout works really well on a planing board, you know, typically over 10, 15 knots, where that actually starts basically, you know, creating some air bubbles. Uh, but for like the, those displacing speeds that we're at, it actually drags quite a bit until you get up to a certain amount of speed. So it just mm -hmm. costs more energy to get a board like that. So if you actually extend your rail along by not having anything cut out of the back or any sort of kicktail, it basically allows the board to just get onto that sort of um, acceleration very quickly without very, a lot of resistance. Yeah, I've noticed too, like when you have a flat tail, it allows you to kind of push off the, the tail a little bit to lift off, right? Like you get a little exactly. bit more so push. It actually versus... forces the board forward more. Yeah. Whereas if we have like our standard sub kick tail thing, yeah. when you kick the back, the board sort of rolls up. Right. But and you can, get, you sort of, can kind of pump up on the foil a little bit earlier, it seems like, right? Yeah. Before you're all playing. it does essentially is engage the foil. And for example, that works okay on like really big foils. Mm -hmm. But especially now that we're on high aspect foils, you know, actually real high aspect foils where you've got quite a, not a lot of surface area and quite a, it will they'll stall if they if you put them at a too high angle of attack they'll stall out so right. it doesn't help you if your board allows you to get it at, at this angle and, and to shove it up on the water as soon as you go mm -hmm. flat the thing is going to go i don't have enough speed and you drop off again right whereas a flat tailed board what it does as soon as you actually over kick the back and it goes forward the fact that that tail is now blocked it'll actually force the board down so any energy you've put downwards is actually going to be converted into forward energy Interesting. So as you're pumping, you accelerate forward. So all your energy is actually going into forward momentum rather than getting you up. But especially high aspect foils, they like that. So they'll get to speed, they'll engage. And then by the time you rise up, they are at a decent amount of speed to fly. Interesting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I like that um, concept. And then you don't think that a flat tail gets in the way sometimes, like just drags in the water. I guess it depends if you're on waves or or just in I've, how I've long your mass is that, and but it, it's conditions. not my experience yeah uh, i ride waves with flat back boards the only thing that sort of does drag if you have a very wide board if i take if i take my 60 liter or 70 liter uh, board on into waves i can't carve as hard because i've got almost yeah i mean 15 inches of tail yeah and that'll so drag that in the turn big, you know it's 60 liters so if i try to carve hard you have that that rail is going to touch, but the back I've typically not touched. You also got to realize if you don't have a kick tail, you don't have all that extra um, tail in the back. Mm -hmm. You can position the foil a lot farther back towards the tail. So that essentially geometry where your foil is flying and you've got something behind your your foil that could touch the wave is not really a, an issue there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So actually, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, obviously, having kind of the wider square tail is, is good for beginners because it's more stable and so on. Yeah. But then, yeah, having like a more like a pintail type shape, it just really makes it easier to, to carve through tighter turns or be on the way of being exactly. kind of more in the pocket without touching, right? Yeah. yeah. Or essentially, the future will go in sort of like more of a dynamic bevel shape where... We won't have a lot of bevel in the front of the board, but it'll sort of, you know, tighten out towards the back where we've got quite a lot of bevel in the back and that will allow hard carving over the tail. And you still have enough sort of flatness or roundness in the nose that, you know, if you do a jump or something that it doesn't sort of catch and just bounces off the water and allowing for easier recovery. Mm. Um, I actually think I saw something from, from Dave, from Dave Kalama that looked, pretty interesting i think one of his downwind boards he's got like that type of yeah. tail shape where it's completely flat there's no more kick tail but his bevel really sort of cuts in quite harsh towards the back right. so if we start specializing more into sort of this is our our, our wave boards for winging they'll start, tend to end to look like that sort of like that very sort of sharp uh, bevel towards the back where you're taking all that area out where you don't really need it for wave riding Mm -hmm. and then for freestyle you will still need that wider back i mean it's essentially like in windsurfing mm -hmm. where we'll essentially have specialized wave wing boards and freestyle wing boards and speed wing boards and whatever else 
Yeah, I mean, one, one thing is like, I find that board design, foil board design is kind of constrained a little bit by the plate mount because you got that, those two flat boxes that basically sure. force you to have a flat section in the back of the board. Whereas if you had a tuttle or whatever, you could have like, like you said, you could bring that thing right up to the very point of the, the tail. Exactly, you, have a, you could have a V. That would be, yeah. for me personally, that would probably be the best. Interesting. Thing. Yeah. But not another issue is actually you, you do lose a lot more if you don't have the tracks. It's having right. that adjustability between foils because the biggest issue for, I mean, for me, if I didn't have, if I had like only a tuttle box would be, I wouldn't be able to ride as many foils as I do. And there's a huge spread. I mean, for example, actually my favorite wing of all times, like this thing here, uh, which is the Moses 1000. I mean, actual high aspect wing. Wow. You know, it's got an aspect ratio of 10, mm -hmm. but it's also got like a more of a kite foil geometry. So the mass is actually really far forward. It's close to the front wing. Yeah. And I have to ride this at least five or six centimeters farther forward than I ride all my other foils. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then not, not being able to move that around would be like, I have to have a different board for every different style of uh, foil that I ride, which is just not uh, practical. Yeah, because I mean, oh. if it was too far back, you basically can't put your back foot back far enough on the board to <laughs> to control yeah. it, basically. Yeah. yeah. But also, I mean, the boards all work, you know, with the rocker lines we have at, at a certain foot placement. And there's right. no point of moving around too much or else the board will either, if you're too far forward, it will start breaking. If it's too far back, it'll always, you know, tend to lift too yeah. early. So, yeah, I mean, having the tracks is good. Yeah, and for sure. The actual thing is there isn't a huge amount of gains from having a little bit of V or having just a tuttle. Um, the actual sort of drag effect or the quant effect doesn't scale as like um, as aggressively as most people think. Because I mean, I've raced um, with, you know, huge adapter pedestals like tuttle box to plate adapters, which are like massive. And you would think they drag like tremendously. But compared to like a normal tunnel, it drags a little bit, but not, not at a really noticeable level. So for, I mean, for example, when I started using the GoFos, that's how I did it. I, my Kais are all had that big, massive aluminum adapter on there. And I still got going on small waves. It didn't drag enough to actually have a big detrimental um, effect. So most plates don't really drag that much more. And yeah, I mean, you do lose a bit of that option of having a bit of a V in the board, but I don't think, you know, yeah. I mean, at the moment you look at what's on the market, there's so many boards on there, which are essentially just, there's so much stuff on there that drags that I don't think people would notice if there was a Tuttle or a plate. <laughs> Yeah. So what do you, um, on, on your boards, do you have a bottom handle and what's your opinion on having a bot bottom handle? Yeah, this is where I, this is where I argue with Indiana, for example. I mean, <laughs> the handles we have on the boards this year, I love them because they're super low key. They have a really sharp, um, basically release. They just go straight into the board. There's no cavity and you know, they're, they're, they're not rounded or anything. So there's very little drag from them. The water just tends to flow over it because there's nothing to go. But all the customers, they want a big fat handle where you can get all your fingers in. And, and I just know that. And it's also because it's not clean. It's not a clean cutoff. So to, to the bottom, it's going to drag. You know, I've done, right. I did the testing with those and they do drag. But people want to carry their boards a bit more comfortably. Mm -hmm. I mean, best case, you don't want anything like that on the bottom. Yeah. You know, yeah, and on our boards. wing foil boards, I, I didn't put handles on the bottom just because I don't want that extra drag and so on and adds weight too and so on. And I find it pretty easy to carry it with just the wing against the board on the deck, right? Exactly. So I mean, I, I carry it on the shoulder. Or I use the, yeah, the tray method. Carry it on the, the foil. Wing. Yeah. But I've learned over the years, you have to do what the customers want a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like that's like one of the main features that people are looking for in a wing fill board is like carry handle. And it Bottom makes handle, sense. You want to make it as it easy as possible. Big and comfortable too. So, right. yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, but as long as they let me keep my flat bottoms and my efficient sort of easy planing, like fast foiling shapes, uh, I'll, 
I'll, be, I'll give them the handle. Yeah. Okay. So let's next, let's talk about wings and what wings you've used and what, what you look for in the wings and so on. Um, I'm going to go back to the, your YouTube channel. Is there, maybe we can, do you have anything I mean, uh, that we if can you look over the watch? years, you'll see I've used quite a lot, especially since the time I sort of went away from ozone. Um, I pretty much, I've tried, I, there's very few wings I actually haven't tried. Um, so you'll see quite a lot of variation of the wings I'm using um, in the videos. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what are things you like or dislike about different the different wings you've tried? And like, yeah. would you change anything? Like if you could design your own wing, what would you do? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing that sort of you, you learn fairly quickly with all winging is stiffness is key. Um, having a wing that sort of, you know, flaps around is too flexible, it just costs power and it sort of adds instability when you're riding them on the waves. Yeah. So stiffness is paramount. That's the, that's the first thing. The wing, whatever wing I have, it, if, I want, if I want it to be good, it has to be rock solid in the air. Um, and then the second thing, actually, and this is a bit of a contention, I need Y handles. I need those Y handles on those wings. Okay. It's so much easier to jump, to wave ride, to do tricks. You know, I, I tend to like on if I have Y handles on a on a on a on a wing, I tend to not use the the front handles. Really? On the strut. Yeah. Okay. I'll always like that's actually an old prototype in that video for from North that doesn't mm -hmm. have any Y handles. If you look at any of the recent ones where I have the production uh, wings, they all have Y handles now. Almost only ever on the Y handle. And that's so um, oh, there's yeah, one with the Y example. handle. Yeah. Was that your your influence on their design? That they I added was quite vocal. I was quite vocal that I wanted those. Yeah. So I'm. I mean, I know we tried both. So I mean, they put them in, so they must have hurt. But I'm pretty pretty sure I'm not the only person who's told them like, look, you know, these are great. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what they else? have to be in the right what, what place. What else on the wing design? Um, having oh, I've got no English word for this. Uh, Forspannung. Um, basically pretension on sort of the first third of the camber in the wings. Yeah. Um, like it's just a tight sort of, profile shape, but kind of a tight Exactly, a, basically a tight tension from, from tip to tip. Yeah. Um, the best way to sort of, the easiest test of this, if you, if you look at a wing that's just sitting on the beach, um, strut down, if you see the profile collapsing in on itself, so if you've got like most cut wings have that center skin now above the strut, if you see that collapsing in, it doesn't have any uh, pretension in that area. Right. And you see decent wings. They're all, when they're sitting there, that profile is pretty, pretty much perfect. Mm -hmm. It's out there. Um, and that pretension, it allows um, the wings to basically generate upwind power a lot better. They, let's say, they fly more like windsurf sails or, or kites. You know, if yeah. you compare it to sort of something that's sort of really floppy and draggy, um mainly a lot of a lot of unbranded stuff from china uh, it just sort of drags downwind and as soon as you try to go upwind that profile is trying to collapse in on itself you know sort of yeah it's like you get backwinded yeah. when, when you're going fast exactly you see it on some popping. of the older designs from last year or some yeah actually some also some of the newer ones but i'm not going to talk about that um but so, essentially yeah if your wing is sort of trying to backwind you for example you get on a wave on side shore wind and you're gonna go hard upwind on that wave and that wing is trying to always sort of collapse back on you that's because it doesn't have enough pretension on on the front yeah or too or too much profile if it's too deep too i think um if it the wing has it can be competent if the if the tension is there it doesn't do that okay yeah that's yeah, true it, it keeps that profile basically taut and it, it stops the wing from back winding yeah, okay. I've, I've had wings, I've tried wings, which have had super thin profiles, but have just not had enough tension. And they've had, hor they've been horrible upwind. Right. Even just trying to ride upwind at speed without the wave. You still feel yeah. that profile compressing and 
So, but when once you depower it, when if it has like a deep profile, even if it has tension, or I guess especially if it has tension with a deep profile, when you depower it on a wave, yeah. I feel like it's not as easy to handle as a flatter wing with less profile. I don't know. Have you had that experience? It again, it depends because it's 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 one variable of so many. Right. But what I tend to see that the fat profile wings. They, they do okay on down the line conditions, but it's just when you're sort of heading back into the wind, like, you know, basically um, sort of offshore conditions when you have a lot more drag from the wing as the profile's thicker. Yep. Uh, and that will slow you down. It makes it a lot less easy to handle. Mm -hmm. um, that, however, is not as bad as, for example, what you see a lot of wings have a tendency to flip over when you're in that type of conditions, when you've let it go on the surf handle. Right. And then they'll flip over. And that has more to do with not having enough tension in the back on well, the trailing edge, or they've got too much dihedral on them. So like that upward V, like from the strut to the tips. Right. Makes um, it want to tip over. I mean, as, as it's probably outdated now, for example, if you look at the, the original wing, uh, the wing foiler, the Echo, um from duotone yeah They're, yeah that thing was terrible when flipping over and stuff exactly and that's I, I always, it's got way it's got way too much dihedral so as soon as he got into the wave it was it started shaking back and forth because it's trying to the wings tapes was trying to sort of center themselves and eventually to just flip over right yeah. yeah and that and those are fairly thin profiled um wings so that there's a lot of other factors which will cause instability when wave riding Okay, so let's talk a little bit about windows and window placement. Um, yeah. I've noticed, like, yeah, obviously some some manufacturers like um, Armstrong and Ozone too. They have a window right above the strut. Yeah. And uh, and I think when when you're like fully powered and you have the wing really vertical to the water, you can actually yeah. kind of see through those windows. But most of the time. The, the window is more, or the wing is more angled, so you can't really yeah. look over the strut, right? Do you yeah. have that experience? Yeah, I mean, I, that's why I've, when I talk about it, I divide the window category into two. I have, I've got what I call passive windows, and I've got active windows. So for me, like an active window, which is, for example, any, any window that's near the strut, is that where you have to move the wing to look through the window. Right. So you can't just sell naturally. So you actually have to do some kind of movement to look through it. Like for example, the Armstrong and the Ozones, you have to sail really low down. You have to actually pull the wing down, which it's not an issue if you're on a three meter, but if you're on a, on a five or six meter, you're very likely if you do that to bury the tip on the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas for example, um, Air Rush or North or Harlem, the, the, the new slick, the windows are passive where you're just sailing and you, 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 you're you looking through the window. Like on this video, you can see right here, I'm just sailing in a normal position. You can see the kiter in front of me. And that's from a mouth camera. Have you compared, um, tested like the identical wings with and without windows? And, and can you tell the yep. difference in performance or like, do you have a personal preference to using windows or no windows? Um, from the testing, they make virtually no difference. I mean, I, I know a lot of people like saying that, okay, that extra weight, you know, makes a huge amount of difference, but we're talking about like 150 grams at worst for having those windows in there. And I mean, if you look at um, how they're placed with most modern wings, they're placed in areas where they're, they're not affecting the profile that much. Like if you look at the north here, they're quite far towards the wingtip, so they're more of a flat area, so they're not in a profiled area. So the performance effect is virtually not there at all. There's there's many other factors which can you know cause a wing to have less power, and it's not the windows. Okay. Um, actually, some of the most powerful wings I've used have had windows, and some of the least powered wings I've I've had have not had windows. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually, I was thinking maybe having the little windows will actually have, um, you know, kind of, if you place them in the right place, maybe have a positive effect on like the profile and stuff like that. But a Possibly. lot of times I see like, 
crinkles in the windows like i don't know just in this picture here i just noticed like um yeah, yeah that's not it. but you see like the window crinkling a lot so and it seems like but that that comes down to the materials we're that. using at the moment mm -hmm. i mean we're using fairly old school materials here we're using vinyl for the windows mm -hmm. um that will probably change in the next years i mean some brands have already started going to xply and uh, more laminate materials for their windows Mm -hmm. or even for the entire wing so we'll probably eventually get proper laminate material which we no longer have a crinkling issue but then they will however make it harder to pack the wing away yeah because then you can't really you have to roll it up without any crinkling right so that i don't know if that's a good solution either i don't but we sort of already are i mean okay most most brands still don't have bags that allow that but north is an example it's a, it's a long bag so you all you do is double the wing so the window is never folded and if you roll it properly you're also not crinkling up the window mm. so it's not hard to pack away your wing if you have a decent bag for it yeah. i mean same thing on the duotones they have the long bags yep so that you don't have to fold across the window mm. so you yeah, it's possible. It's it's. It, I don't think it's a big issue. It's more of a how you decide to pack up your wing. Yeah, um, I mean, I've been using a wing without windows. Like the PPC wings don't have windows, and I actually yeah. really like it. Um, you don't have to worry about you know. I just kind of roll it up and and crunch it together and push it in the bag, True. and it's no. You don't have to worry about rolling it up a certain way, and then I don't really find it hard to look under either under the wing when I'm when I want to see what's going on, but. I mean, if you want your wing to last a long time, just like with your kite, you should pack it away carefully <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. You want to make it last. I mean, a lot of brands also haven't solved the, the bladder twisting issue yet. Right. So it's always a good idea to roll it tightly and cleanly. Well, but one mistake I've seen people make is um, trying to like fold it in like the same location, like they fold the full and half, wing in half before they roll it up, things like that. Yeah. Um, and then if you have a sa the same fold that's always in the same location that can, you know, damage the sail material and also the, the bladders, you know, if you always have like the, those folds in the same place and roll it up t too tightly. Uh, like I actually like to not roll, pack my wing up too tightly because then I feel like it's, it's um, better for the wing to be a little bit loose, you know, loosely uh, packed. That said, I've done the longevity tests, like, the i mean the north wing is packed that way i pack it tight and i pack it basically folded in half all the time uh -huh. and that one that's in that video is now reaching about 200 hours um there is no crease and there's no issue with the bladders actually this is the only only wing i haven't had a bladder issue yet with huh. okay all, all other other wings i've tried there's been some some time where the bladder has had holes or it's twisted like fallen out and exploded when you pumped it up again um so i okay i don't really crush it down and pack it but i mean i fold it in half because that's the way it's designed to do so you don't crease the window but i've not had any issues with any any creases forming on the strut or any or in the sail material nice yeah, so all right, uh, Gunnar, uh, thanks so much. I mean, that's great information. Um, I have about, I only have about 10 more minutes because I have like a, an appointment I have to go to. Sure. But let's talk a little bit about kind of, um, you know, I always ask people this question, like during the pandemic, you know, obviously there's a lot of change happening and a lot of people were are affected by it, um, you know, feeling lonely, anxious and or depressed and so on. So did you experience any of those kind of and how what do you do to stay positive and um i'm going to make it a little bit harder so you can't say i'm just going to go wing foiling or get on the water because that's too easy we all know that works but um yeah how, how do you keep a positive outlook and how do you make the best of of your situation i mean i mean for us it's a bit different here i mean we only had our lockdown last year for three months i mean they shut us in for pretty much three months straight and that that was pretty hard um but i mean i'm lucky i mean 
Doris is great and my kids great. So it's pretty easy to get along with them. Um, plus I have a bunch of other hobbies other than water sports. Um, I mean, I, I'm a musician, I play drums, I play guitar and stuff. I mess around with electronics and a bunch of drones and everything back there. So, I mean, I've got stuff to keep me busy and so on. And, um, and funnily at the time, the sort of back end part of the industry was going off because in mainland Europe, everyone was buying wing equipment and people couldn't get enough. So I had quite a lot of work to do designing boards and foils for people. So that kept me busy. Um, what I found later, like now as it's progressed on, because it's a bit of a, a drag, especially with the shop, is just you got to try to stay above all the, the BS that you read online and, you know, the, 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 all the garbage that people bring to you. Like when they, you know, we've had incidents where people have come to the beach, they've been stressed and they're they're not doing that great with the whole situation and you know they take it with them onto the water and that's just we try to calm them down and have conversations and so on and but you know it's you got to try to sort of you know we're on the water we keep that that side away you know you want to you want to talk about business not going well or you know whatever theories you have like just when we're having fun on the water and so we just no, leave that out and like don't you should don't yell at people don't cause any problems and so on because it's just it's the water sports island we're trying to you know keep everybody happy you know yeah. so yeah we try to do that but i mean we've been lucky in the fact that after those three months of being locked in completely we uh we've been we've been fairly good here we've you know not had any other lockdowns we've been allowed to do sports all the time now so no, we're good. So I can't really say I've had to deal with so much of an like a depression here or anything like that. That's good. Good to hear. So I mean, yeah, you just touched on it, like being in the wrong state of mind when you're on the water, obviously, you know, and I don't, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure you know the feeling, but sometimes we get into that state where everything just clicks and, and you just feel in tune with everything, with your gear, with the, with nature, with the waves and the wind. So yeah. And, and it feels like you can't do, do any wrong, right? You, you're pulling off stuff and everything, but how do you get into that state of mind? And do you have any tip pointers on, on getting into that, into that zone? I mean, for me, I mean, for example, if I'm trying to like learn something new and the trick, I try to basically try to remove any sort of barriers I have. So if I know I want to have a fun session, I want to learn something new, I will prepare my equipment as such. I will take an easier foil, slightly bigger board. I'm trying to make the most of it. I'm not going to try to, you know, push the level. I'm just going to go out, have fun, make it easy. So I'll take a bigger foil, a little bit bigger board. Is the wind a bit light? I'll take a bigger wing, even though I could take a smaller one, just to not have to deal with any of the issues there so I can just concentrate on one thing and then most of the time that actually then works out because I'm not having to worry about not having enough power in the wing my board being too small or the foil not working so I'll just go out everything my equipment's working fine and I can just work on myself it's like what am I doing wrong how can I improve and then when you after about 100 tries you do land the trick and you're like yes <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the greatest feeling. session ever yeah. I mean, and sometimes I, I find that, you know, you try it a hundred times and then you never make it. And then the next time you go out, you're like fresh and you, maybe you thought about it while you took a little break and, and then you go back and the first time you try it, you pull it off perfectly. And it's like, you also have oh, to know when to, when, when to stop. I mean, a lot of people yeah. in the training, they just, like I said, your, your body needs time to sort of, you know, internalize. Right. So, you know, if I, if I'm out there and I'm not getting the, if I've done like 50 tries, and I've no, I'm not closer to it. I think they'll sail back to the beach and just like sit down, like calm down. What am I doing wrong? Well, what, what could possibly be going or just stop and mm -hmm. then come back the next day. And then usually the next day, all of a sudden it's like, boom, first try. And you're like, yeah. wow. Yeah, just yeah. The body needs time to do it. So if you, if you, if you get frustrated, you just do it over and over again, it might not work on that day. You just have to accept that this right. is not going to happen. And then right. 
try it the next day and then it might work better. I know you're, you know, you're super into foiling and I, I, I don't know, I, I always call myself a foil addict, but um, would you say, I mean, has it changed for you over the years how passionate you are about foiling and is there a dark side to being a foil addict? I mean, the cool side of foiling is that it's been evolving so fast and so much. I mean, um, every time I saw, I saw, I think I'm getting bored of a certain thing. Like when I started, you know, kite foil freestyle or kite foil racing, as soon as I got bored of that, something else has come along. When, when I started getting a bit bored of normal kite foiling, surf foiling came along. And then when I got really sick of racing like two years ago, wing foiling came along. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always been like something new and it's i'm always a fairly early adopter with things so if, if i find something oh that's cool i get really into it so it just keeps the whole thing alive for me because you know i'm really interested in progress in general so I, I don't i don't have any preconceptions of well that's new that doesn't work i don't want to do that i'm typically cool how do i do that right so in foiling is so versatile that you can do almost anything so you never get bored so and then your wife is pretty accepting that you're out on the water till dark if it's good or stuff like that <laughs> yeah uh, she knew what she got into when she got together with me like back right. then with the kiting so so yeah i mean I, I'm, I'm not i'm not as fanatic as i used to be to be on the water i mean you spend some time with the family a little bit um um, and like, I try also not to get the blinds on too much because you know, so I like to play music and other things too. So yeah, so she, she's very accepting. I mean, she kites too, and she wants to learn to wing now also. And, awesome. you know, I also spend quite a lot of time like now with my daughter Xenia trying to teach her to wing and to kite and get her into water sports a lot more because she really loves being in the water. And, so, and she's only eight years old and you're already getting yeah. an award. Yeah. So, awesome. So where, where do you think, um, what's the next cool thing like you were talking about how foiling keeps progressing do you have any ideas on what what's what comes next or do you have any crazy concepts or ideas you you've thought of not recently <laughs> um i mean i just see there's going to be quite a lot of evolution in materials in the next few years especially for the wings so there's a lot of cool exciting things that we can try and do just get basically the stuff's going to get lighter more powerful and yeah, probably see through. So yeah. that's going to be really cool. And then, yeah, the foils, it's the same. There's a lot of progression on the foils. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we call high aspect now, or what most brands call high aspect foils now, are just not. And it'd be interesting to see how far we can push that aspect of things. Also, the pumping side. Um, we're just fig just now figuring out how to get like the dock starting, how to get you now foils that anybody can pump. So that's sort of also the new frontier. It's not just like super fit um, guys basically doing dock starts and pumping and being able to go 500, 600 meters under their own power. Um, mm -hmm. We're designing foils now where anybody can do it. You can put a 150 kilo guy on this thing and he will also manage to do it. So that's sort of a new sort of sport, that especially for a lot of like the no wind areas. It's also going to be exploding in the next couple of years too. The foil pumping, yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good, interesting area to, to expand because that's something too where you don't even need wind you just need water <laughs> exactly that's the one thing i don't have here i don't have a dock to start off it's actually yeah. i've been trying it it's damn hard <laughs> it looks pretty easy that, actually right. that comes down to foil yeah. what foil you use yeah well I've, i think i have a, a good foil for it you know the axis um what is it 11 50 or something like that but yeah it's a good it's a no, actually other that's people pump on it don't don't learn it on a high aspect foil. Oh. What, what actually, you... they, 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 they do take a bit more takeoff speed and they're not forgiving. Right. Actually, well, I've tried it on high... the, um, I've tried it on the Armstrong 2400 and that was hard too. I don't know. What you want is actually a cheap ass gong or from Indiana, the 1100. It's got like, it's a super thick sort of lifter profile. So um, even if you're stopped, you can still push it forward. Hmm. Okay. Whereas most of the higher aspect are more performance foils, the thinner profile foils is that when you, you've messed up and you've, you've sort of stalled, all you can do is shoot it up and you fall off the back. Whereas on mm. these things, they may, may be slow, but 
when you jump on it, you can get the angle totally wrong and you can still recover. You can stop and you can keep pumping. That's a good point. Yeah. So yeah. That makes a huge difference when you're learning. So yeah, if you can get something that's super fat and inefficient in that sense, yeah, but forgiving, yeah, that'll actually make that dog starting thing so much easier. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. With too much performance. It's not easy. Cool. Well, there's a bunch more questions I wanted to ask you about being a YouTuber and, and, you know, staying motivated to make new videos and so on. But um, I guess we'll have to, we'll have to set up another yeah. interview in the future for sure. Maybe in, in like in half a year or something like that, when you have some more stuff to talk about, cool. we'll do it again. But I, I could just keep going. Like I always go way over anyways, but uh, thanks so much for your time, Gunnar. Really appreciate uh, thank it. Thank you for, for the chat. Yeah. So, and then, yeah, we'll get back together in the future. All right. Have a good one. Aloha. Thanks, man. Have a good day. <laughs> you too. All right. Congratulations. You made it to the end. And that means you are officially part of the full crazy 5% club that watches the whole damn thing. So thanks for being here still. And I do have a couple of special announcements just for you guys. First of all, next week's interview is with the legendary Mark Rappahorst. I just finished my interview with him. Super long, super interesting stuff. He's the mastermind behind the SIC brand and now makes the Flying Dutchman foil boards. Amazing stuff. Um, he is just a master at his craft. So very interesting interview. And I hope you can catch that on the next Blue Planet show. Second of all, next month, for the month of June, I'm planning to post a new video every day, every single day of the month. So 30 new videos in one month. So I'm committed to posting a new video every day and I wanna also post some videos from the viewers like you. So I'm gonna have a little video contest and uh, I just wanted to show you this. You know what this is? It's $2,000 in cash. And I'm gonna hand that out to whoever posts the best video. So I'm gonna announce the, those rules later on, but basically uh, any video between 30 seconds long and up to three minutes long, uh, just send it to me, you know, send a link that I can download the video from or whatnot. And uh, I'll pick a video of the day every day of the month, post it on YouTube. So the winner is not necessarily going to be the most popular one or the one with the most thumbs up, although that is important. So basically you will be judged by a panel of one, which is me, on a bunch of different categories. So I'll announce that later on what I'm looking for in the videos, but just um, fun stuff, um, whatever videos that are mostly wing foil related uh, will be great. And I'll be sharing those on a daily basis next month. So um, you can start submitting them as soon as you can. The sooner you submit it, the more chances you have of it getting posted and a chance to win the $2,000 in cash. And going back, um, we've been posting videos on YouTube since 2008. So that's been a long time ago. I just went back to the very first video we posted, which was a C4 Waterman demo day back in September 2008. And my son, who's 15 years old now, was a toddler and he fell asleep on my board. It's a nice video about the demo day and it stars Tia Carrera, Brian Kailana, a bunch of legends. So uh, the only downside of that video, it's made for a tiny phone screen. It was made for the old school cell phones and a very compressed file that you can watch on a tiny cell phone. So you have to watch it on a smaller screen, but it's a cool little video. And I realized it only got about 200 views and only two thumbs up. So I'm gonna put the link below and up here as well. So please click on it, check it out, give it a thumbs up if you like it and give it some love, all right? And of course this interview too, if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber already, please subscribe to the Blue Planet Surf YouTube channel and don't miss our daily videos in June. Okay, thanks again for watching. Thanks, Gunnar, for your time. And we'll see you next time on the Blue Planet Show. Aloha, see you on the water.